here though for all his help. So today we're talking about Benford's Law, subtitled, How It Turns Out That One Is Not The Loneliest Number. And if you don't know what Benford's Law is, you don't know yet why that's hilarious. And if you do know what Benford's Law is, you know it's actually not that funny. So <laughs> anyway, we're going to talk a little bit about what this is. So we're going to start off by talking about what Benford's Law is, some distributions for which it applies, um, data for which it works, why it works, so on and so forth. Then we're going to get into proving this awesome fact that the Fibonacci's are Benford. And then we're going to come back to the PowerPoint to look at some real-life applications of Benford's, of which there are many, and they're all very interesting. Um, so I hope you guys all enjoy. So what is exactly is Benford's Law? Well, the best way to explain it maybe is for all of us to just pretend we have one big hat here. We've put numbers in here, areas of rivers, populations of countries, whatever we could find. And we're picking a number out of this, and we're saying, what is the probability that it starts with a 1, 2, 3, so on and so forth? And if you think that I did, as I did a couple months ago, that maybe it would be 11% for each digit, because why would it not be? You'd be completely wrong. Because it actually turns out that the number will start with 1 about 30% of the time, and will start with a 9 only about 4.6% of the time. So it's a huge difference. So let's look at this quickly in our graph. So you can see here we have the expected proportion of numbers beginning with the leading digit n is actually equal to log base 10 n plus 1 over n. So if we plug in 1, we end up getting 0 0.301, 9, 0 0.046. So you can see the big difference between 1 and 9 here. And at this point, you might be asking, well, if this is, if there's such a big difference between the number of numbers starting with 1 and the number of numbers starting with 9, how have I never noticed this before? Um, and actually, the answer might lie in the fact that the guy who first noticed it actually was not using TI-84 or TI-89 plus silver editions or whatever to do calculations. He was using log tables. And he actually noticed in using log tables that the pages that had digits where the numbers where the first digit was 1 were actually way more worn out than the other pages. So he basically was like, wait, maybe that means something more than the fact that they're just coincidentally more worn out. So he actually conjectured that not all digits are equally likely, and that, in fact, maybe there were just more numbers that started with 1. But we don't talk about Newcomb's Law. We talk about Benford's Law. So we're actually talking about this guy, who said the exact same thing way later, but we talk about him anyway. Um, he basically wrote a paper where he not only made the same conjecture about log base 10 n plus 1 over n, but also managed to um, show different data sets that followed or didn't follow. So he looked at areas of rivers, populations of countries, some certain mathematical sequences, Fibonacci numbers, get excited, um, and it, the numbers from an issue of Reader's Digest. And he showed that while some of them fit Benford's very well and some of them didn't, the union of all of them actually fit Benford's law the best, which is very interesting. Um, so let's look at some examples here. So newspaper numbers, population numbers, Dow Jones, all fit very well. Um, and if you're a skeptic like me, you might have thought, oh, this wouldn't apply for something like my thesis data. But oh wait, it does, kind of. Um, and well, I just threw all these wine prices together to see whether it would fit, because that's like what I'm doing with these songs. Anyway, so the, and the chi-square statistics is actually 0.65. So it doesn't fit it as well as if that was 0.93 or something like that. The Fibonacci numbers fit much better than this, but just to give you an idea, of, you can actually do this for fun if you're curious about anything that you guys have as data. Come talk to me after. Um, so anyway, let's talk about things that will follow Benford's and things that won't. You shouldn't go out there thinking that this is going to work for anything. So things that will work well, numbers that result from mathematical combinations of things, so price times quantity, transaction level data, stock market prices, and Dow Jones, like I mentioned before, all will work well. Fibonacci numbers, I'm still keeping you guys excited about that um, for the future, it's in bold. Uh, anyway, so things that won't fit well, assign numbers like check numbers and invoice numbers, random number generators won't give you things that have a Benford distribution. Also things that don't cover or multiple orders of magnitude, IQ scores, human heights, Erdos numbers, if you're curious, will also not work. Um, and even if you cover multiple orders of magnitude, you need to cover them smoothly. So what I mean by that is, if I look at the sequence 10 to the 1, 10 to the 2, 10 to the 3, up to 10 to the 100, that covers a lot of orders of magnitude, but that won't work because it's basically hitting specific points throughout that. So you need to cover it somewhat smoothly also. So that's a good thing to talk about. So the last thing that I'm going to talk about before we get into proving that the Fibonacci numbers are Benford is various approaches that have been taken to explaining Benford's law intuitively. So once again, a set of numbers is Benford if the probability of observing n as the leading digit is log base 10 n plus 1 over n. And the first way of explaining this that came about actually was in Benford's paper. 
there's a geometric explanation basically saying if we have a constant growth rate, we'll end up being Bedford. So let's just talk about what that really means. So say we have a 4% growth rate maybe in a stock or something. Imagine we start at $1. It will actually take about 17 years to get to $2, but it will only take about two or three years to get from 9 to 10. So you spend more time at lower digits than at higher digits. So that's basically what he was saying about um, the constant growth rates. Um, two other things worth mentioning are scale invariance and base invariance. So scale invariance is the idea that if Benford's law is something that is a universal law, we shouldn't care whether we're in yen or dollars or whatever, it should hold throughout units. Um, and base invariance is the idea that we shouldn't care what base we're in. And base invariance actually was used by T.P. Hill in 1995 to, to do a very rigorous proof of Benford's law. He basically assumed base invariance of the law and then proved Benford's law from there. Okay, so we've now gotten to where we want to be, which is talking about the proofs that we're going to do on the board here, so I can work this technology. Um, so the first thing that we want to do in order to show that the Fibonacci's are Benford is prove something called the fundamental equivalence of Benford's law, which basically says that if we have yn equal to log base 10 of xn, and this is equidistributed mod 1, then we get that xn is Benford. And yn is equidistributed mod 1, basically, if the probability of yn mod 1 falling in any subinterval of 0, 1 is proportional to the length of that interval. So a, b, equals b, I say. Um, and the reason that we want to do this is because if we can end up showing that log base 10 of the sequence of Fibonacci's is equidistributed mod 1, we get from that that the Fibonacci's are best friend. So that's the, what we're going to be doing. And in order to get to this point, we're going to be using a characterization of the growth of the Fibonacci numbers, talking about Binet's formula, proving Binet's formula, which is basically a unique way to determine each Fibonacci number. If I plug in 0, I get 0, 1, 1, 1, 2, 1, and so on. Um, and then I'm going to appeal to the kronecker weil theorem that says that if a number is irrational, then n, that number, mod 1, is equidistributed mod 1. So these two things will come together, as you'll see in a little bit, in order to let us show that log base 10 of the sequence of Fibonacci numbers is equidistributed mod 1, which by the first thing means that the Fibonacci is a factor. So in order to show this first thing, we have to first show two lemmas. So our first lemma says that if u equals v mod 1, then 10 to the u, 10 to the v have the same first digit. This is a nice simple curve to start us off. So we know that v equals u plus m, where m is an integer, because of mod 1 just means they have the same fractional piece. Um, and we can write 10 to the u as uk, 10 to the k plus uk minus 1, 10 to the k minus 1, and so on, down to the 1's digit, where we have u naught, and then u minus 1, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 1. So this is now the fractional pieces, and so on. Um, something we also know is that 10 to the v equals 10 to the u plus m which, if we call all of this stuff star, is actually just the same thing as star times 10 to the m, which then we end up getting is equal to uk 10 to the k plus m plus uk minus 1, 10 to the k plus m minus 1, and so on. So we're actually done here because we're aware of the fact that the first digit of 10v is the same as the first digit of 10u. So we've shown that. So that's good. So now we're going to do another lemma before we get into the proof of the theorem, which says that y mod 1 is in the interval log base 10 d, log base 10 d plus 1, if and only if the first digit of 10 to the y is d. So the first thing that we want to do is actually by lemma 1, we assume that y is in 0, 1. So we assume that y is equal to y mod 1. And once we do that, we have y is in log base 10 d, log base 10 d plus 1, this interval, which we know is true if and only if, just by knowing what intervals mean. Um, 10 to the log base 10 d is less than or equal to 10 to the y, less than 10 to the log base 10 d plus 1 which then just gives us d is less than or equal to 10 to the y, less than d plus 1. And since y is a fractional piece, we can then see from here that the first digit of 10 to the y is d. So this is awesome. 
Okay, great. So we've shown these two lemmas, and now we can actually show that first theorem that we want to show. Okay. So the first thing we're going to do, we assume the left-hand side. So we assume yn is equidistributed mod 1. And then by lemma 2, we can say that the set, the set of numbers for which the first digit of xn is d is the same as the set of numbers for which yn mod 1 is in the interval log base 10 d log base 10 d plus 1. And the reason that we can now be talking about the first digit of x to the n is because we were talking about the first digit of 10 to the y earlier and we defined y as log base 10 of xn. Okay, so now that we know that these two are equal, we can go further and talk about the proportion of numbers for which the first digit of xn is d <coughs> being equal to the proportion of numbers for which yn mod 1 is in this interval we were talking about before, log base 10 d log base 10 d plus 1. So we have that these two are equal. Now, what did we assume in the beginning? We assumed that yn is equidistributed mod 1. And if you guys can go back to the definition over here and remember what that means, we actually can say that this right-hand side is equal to the difference between log base 10 d plus 1 and log base 10 d, which by log laws then is just log base 10 d plus 1 over d. So what does this statement say at the end? It says that the proportion of numbers for which the first digit of xn is d is equal to log base 10 d plus 1 over d, which is familiar because it's what I'm talking about. <laughs> so this actually shows that it was log. Awesome. So now that we've talked about this, we've proven the fundamental equivalence, which means now our goal has shifted from showing the Fibonacci's are Benford to being able to show that the Fibonacci's are equidistributed mod 1. And so let's take a second to remember what the Fibonacci numbers are. So oftentimes we give them seed value f of 0 equals 0, f of 1 equals f of 2 equals 1, and then we say that f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. So you get 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, and so on, just by adding the previous two to get the next one. So this is a recursive formula of the Fibonacci numbers, but there also exists a non-recursive definition, well, formula, which goes something like this, phi to the n minus phi hat to the n over phi minus phi hat. And phi is probably something you've heard about before, the golden ratio, which is 1 plus root 5 over 2. Meanwhile, phi hat is 1 minus root 5 over 2. And another important thing to note about these, actually, is that their roots to the equation x squared minus x minus 1 equals 0. And you might be saying, well, I know that that's obviously super interesting, but why is it relevant? And you will see soon. So this is ways to keep you excited. Um, anyway, so now we're in the pr we want to prove why Binet's formula holds, because we're talking about how this characterizes growth. But we need to believe that this is actually true. So let's use everyone's favorite technique called induction. Um, if we take base case n equals 0, we get f of 0 equals 1 minus 1 over phi minus phi hat, which is 0. We like that. If n equals 1, we get f of 1 equals phi minus phi hat over phi minus phi hat, which is 1, which we also like. And now we assume it's true for all k greater than 1, k greater than or equal to 1, and n less than or equal to k. And we want to show that it's true for n equals k plus 1. So since we have assumed this, we can actually say f of k equals phi to the k minus phi hat to the k over phi minus phi hat, and f k minus 1 equals phi to the k minus 1 minus phi hat to the k minus 1 over phi minus phi hat. And you might be saying, OK, that's awesome that we know those two things, but I don't understand how we're getting here. And the answer actually lies back in the way we define the Fibonacci numbers. Isn't that so nice? So we actually know that the sum of these two things gives us fk plus 1, which then is phi to the k minus 1, phi plus 1, minus phi hat to the k minus 1, 
b hat plus 1 all over b minus b hat. So this isn't exactly in the form we want, but we had mentioned something earlier, which I had said was super interesting, which was that these two are actually roots of x squared minus x minus 1 equals 0, which means that x squared equals x plus 1. Well, what do we have here? b plus 1. This becomes b squared, and this becomes b hat squared, which gives you exactly what you want, which is b to the k minus 1, k plus 1, b hat, k plus 1, over b minus b hat, which is exactly what we wanted to show. Okay, so now we all believe this formula. So again, why are we talking about this formula? Well, we're trying to talk about the growth of the Fibonacci's, and we're trying to kind of get at what potentially is the log base 10 of the Fibonacci's. So we're going to look more deeply at um, Binet's formula right now. So um, one other way that we can write this is as 1 over root 5 b to the n minus negative b to the negative n. And you can also see this as some a b to the n plus some b negative b to the negative n. And so if we were looking at just this, we would have actually what we would call a pure geometric. However, we clearly have this b term over here that we're not too happy about. So we'll come back to this later. But for right now, we're going to show why if the Fibonacci numbers were actually just equal to this, we would have echo distribution mod 1. So for what I'm about to do right now, remember that we're ignoring this term and we'll come back to it very briefly. So if we assume that f of n equals a b to the n, we get that log base 10 f of n equals log base 10 a plus n log base 10 b. Now log base 10 f of n, this is looking like something promising since we want to show actually that this is equidistributed mod 1 in order to get from won't affect equidistribution, which means that actually if we show that n log base 10 of phi is equidistributed mod 1, then we have that this is equidistributed mod 1. So now the new goal is show that this is equidistributed mod 1. You might be saying, well, I don't know how to do that. And that's what this last thing is for, actually. Something awesome, I think someone else did a quote we have on, called the kronecker weil theorem, that says that if alpha is irrational, then n alpha mod 1 is equidistributed. So if you're looking at this, actually, if we say alpha is log base 10 of phi, then we end up actually being able to, by kronecker weil state that this is equidistributed mod 1. So clearly what we need to show right now is that log base 10 of phi is irrational. Well, we know how to do this type of stuff. Just assume that it is rational and then show that that's insane. Um, anyway, so log base 10 of phi would be p over q, p, q in the integers, and q is not 0. Then we end up getting that, remember what phi is, it's 1 plus root 5 over 2 equals 10 to the p over q, which gives us 1 plus root 5 over to the q equals 10p, 2 to the q. Now, since q is not 0, by the binomial theorem, since this is a plus, we have that the left-hand side is a plus b root 5, where b is non-zero. Meanwhile, on the right-hand side, we have just an integer. So clearly, since b is not 0, these two things cannot be equal. So we end up with a large contradiction here, which allows us to come to the conclusion that, in fact, log base 10 of phi is irrational. OK, great. So what we've done is we've shown that log base 10 of phi is irrational, which by the chronicler while theorem allows us to state that n log base phi is equidistributed mod 1, which by this thing that we derived from as though the Fibonacci's were just a pure geometric, means that log base 10 of f of n is equidistributed mod 1, which by the first thing means that the Fibonacci's are benford. Okay, cool. So the last thing that we need to talk about right now is that b that I ignored earlier. We're not just going to walk away pretending that um, I didn't just ignore that. So let's talk about another way that we can look at the Nays formula. So we had before that we had a phi to the n, b negative phi to the negative n. So let's rewrite this as f of n equals a b to the n 1 plus b over a negative 1 to the n b to the negative 2n. So we're just factoring out a and b to the n 
Now let's take logs of both sides. Log base 10 of both sides. And we end up getting that log base 10 f of n is log base 10 of a plus n log base 10 of b plus log base 10 of this whole thing. Okay. And since we know that log of 1 plus x is approximately x, we can say that this last term is actually approximately b over a, negative 1 to the n, b to the negative 2n. And what's important to note in talking about this term now is that the absolute value of b to the negative 2 is less than 1, which means as n gets bigger and bigger and bigger, this is getting really negligible. So we're actually able to now say that this term is just negligible. Okay. And we like this because of the fact that now we're saying if we're considering enough Fibonacci numbers, so some big enough n, um, even 100 will work, we can actually just go back to saying that log base 10 of f of n is log base 10 of a plus n log base 10 of b. And as I said before, since we showed that log base 10 of b is irrational, we have equidistribution by chronic while, and this whole thing allows us to go back to the very first thing that we proved in order to say that the Fibonacci's are Ben proved. So the whole thing is proven. It's a bigger box. Um, awesome. So now, oh, awesome. We have so much time to talk about applications. Okay. <laughs> That's, that's exciting, because that's the really exciting part. Okay, so now let's talk about some of the reasons why um, the, oh, well, first of all, let's show this graph. So this is pretty much showing what I was just saying, that the Fibonacci's tend to obey Benford's law. It also shows that Lucas numbers tend to obey Benford's law. So this is just considering the first 100. If you consider a 1,000 or a million, it gets even closer. Um, okay, so let's talk about applications of Benford's law. So. One of the most popular applications of Benford's law actually lies in fraud detection. So um, when I, let's say, go up to Michael and I say, can you create a fake sequence of heads or tails coin flips? Maybe Michael's really smart, but maybe Michael doesn't do something like doesn't include a sequence of six straight heads or tails. So he thinks that that's probable, but in reality, it would actually be very probable for in 200 coin flips for there to be a six straight heads or six straight tails. So I talk about that because this is very similar. If you don't know about Benford's Law and you're trying to kind of cook the books and fill in the blanks, you end up doing things like having too many fives to start, too many sixes to start, and so on. So Benford's Law is actually admissible in court and has been used on an international level to prove tax fraud, money laundering, and so on. Um, Greece's numbers in the European Union, <laughs> when Greece was like, I want to be part of this, they submitted GDP numbers that later were shown to be fraudulent using Benford's. But it was too late, they were already in. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> you can see that that's um, actually really interesting. Um, another thing is that Benford's has been used for to, compute, to talk about future computer design. So um, a way to think about that is that if you know that there are going to be a lot of ones maybe showing up, you can kind of maximize storage space to make that more efficient. So um, I don't know that much about computers, so the analogy that I would make is, you know, if you have a cash register and you know that there are going to be a lot, a lot of $10 bills, but really no $100 bills, you might actually change the spaces of the slots, right, to make things more efficient. Um, um, also, since we're all students, you might be wondering, is there any way I can um, use this to do well on multiple choice tests without knowing anything? Um, and to talk about that, I'll just briefly mention there was actually a group of physics students who tried to create a mock exam and test whether they could actually beat a test just by picking the answer with the lowest leading digit. So the, everything had A, B, C. Um, so they all had three possible choices. Let's say um, you just if A was 1,000 and then 2,000, 3,000, they'd always pick 1,000. And if two things have the same leading digit, choose randomly between them. And so they created a mock exam where the Correct answers followed Benford's, but the incorrect answers didn't follow Benford's, and then we're able to exploit that by getting about a 51% on that test, which was better than random chance, right? right. Better, that's what's important. Not that it's 51%. Um, however, in real testing, the incorrect answers will also follow Benford's law. So you actually can't exploit this, sorry. So at this point, you might be saying, well, you're running out of time, and you've told me about a test that I can't beat, computers which I'm not designing, and fraud that I'm not currently detecting at Williams. So my last suggestion is to hustle your friends, maybe, using this information. <laughs> so 
there used to, there was actually a series of um, instances where people were hustling each other using the farmer's almanac. So just pulling this thing open that has like astron astronomical data, astro data related to astronomy, <laughs> and um, other weather data and stuff like that, and they'd pull it open and say, I'll take one if you take nine as the leading digit. It's very good odds for you. Um, and similarly, if you want to just pull up a random Fibonacci number, you'll also probably do pretty well for yourself. Um, so hopefully those are more useful applications for you guys, but I hope that um, this was interesting and I hope you guys now can recite the proof of why the Fibonacci's are Benford as well. Um, that's it. <laughs>